very, and diseased trees bear bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and then thrown in the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. All right. Thank you, Abel. All right. Let's pray this morning. Lord, we thank you that you loved us so much, that you cared for us so much, that you gave us this wonderful sermon, this wonderful teaching, that you have blessed us all these years, having protected your word and brought it to us to give us understanding of your kingdom and who you are, that you cared us enough not to leave us there, but to press us for a decision, press us for the choice with the declaration, with the work of entering the narrow gate. We thank you for your spirit, which changes us, which gives us that ability, which grows us. We pray today, Father, for um, sanctification in this, for an understanding, for growth, for change, that you will make us more like you and less like ourselves. We pray that this time of year, as we put a special emphasis on uh, your son, on his sacrifice. We put a special emphasis today just thanking you for that, for the glory of your work that you completed in your son. We pray that uh, you'll fill us with joy and understanding and appreciation uh, for what you have done. I pray that we will celebrate the good blessings that you have given us and each other today as we spend time with one another and, and fellowship and hearing your word preached and taught and, and uh, with the good food that we're going to enjoy later today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So let's set this scene once again. Jesus is painting for us an extremely vivid picture of somebody traveling along a comfortable road, wide road, easy road, with all of your friends, lots of people, having a good time, and all of a sudden, what do we come to in the road that we saw last week? What do we hit? What do we come upon? A Y. A, y, a fork, an exit, a turn, whatever you want to call it. Um, and just like our roads, there's a sign on this road, a sign marking both directions. Um, the sign on each of those, just like our road signs, they tell you typically where that direction is going. What does the sign say that's marking both of these roads, the wide and narrow? What do the signs say that's marking where they're going? Who remembers? Heaven. They both say heaven. Exactly. Of course, we know that the wide road, when it says heaven, it means trusting in your own works, your own goodness, your own righteousness, your own ways. And the narrow one means trusting in heaven by Christ alone. Now, what were some of the difficulties laid out for us last week by Christ in reaching that eternal life? What were some of the things about the gate, about the road, um, that were difficult that Jesus told us were there? First of all, with the, with the gate, it's narrow, right? It's narrow. I don't know about y'all, but, you know, I drive a pretty big truck, and if I'm coming up to a gate, I like a nice wide open gate. For, for you West Monroeans, you may remember years ago before they built that shinny bypass off the interstate, do y'all remember that railroad trestle that you would drive under that had, that each lane, you know, had, I mean, that, that thing couldn't have been more than maybe 10 inches wider than a car going through it, Maybe. No, definitely not a big tree. It was this narrow. It was, it was narrow, so it was difficult. Um, so you got the narrow gate. What, what else? What else was, was made uh, the difficulties of the, of the narrow gate? What about the path itself? What does it say about the path? Straight. Straight. All right. It's hard. All right. Straight and hard. We got a visitor there today. There might be probably some of those on the path. That's all right. <laughs> yeah, he's a new friend. That's right. So few will find it. 
Right, so there's two things that it tells us there, that few will find it, meaning one, you have to find it, so you must seek it, it's not easy to find. Few will find it, so maybe it, it, it's potentially lonely. You're leaving the mass of humanity to go on this road. Um, uh, it says that it's hard, it's uncomfortable. I mean, it hurts your feet, it hurts your back to walk on this thing, it's difficult. Um, you have to stop going in the direction you are, because I, I think, you know, some people took at that analogy last when you think, okay, it's a why that you come to and you choose one way or the other. In a sense, that's true, but as we talked about last week, you are on the easy road. You are having to stop the flow that you're in, find this difficult-to-find entrance, discard everything that you have to fit through the gate, and then even if you manage to do that, it's a hard path. But it's a, it's a separate road you've got to get off of. Now, this week, in this new section, we see Jesus adds a new difficulty and is warning us um, about the new difficulty of eternal life getting on the narrow path. What is, what is the new difficulty he adds to it here in verse 15 of the narrow path? What do you see? What is it? Mm. False prophets. So that picture again, we're standing there. We're, we, we, we've managed to see this other option for us. There's signs that make it look the same. It's difficult, all this stuff. And on top of all that, you've got these heralds. You've got these people at each path. And you've got these false prophets trying to lie to you and to deceive you with the sole goal of keeping you on that wide easy, comfortable, populated path. Exactly, yeah. Why wouldn't it be, right? It just makes sense. Absolutely, absolutely. How successful are these false prophets at deceiving people to stay on the wide road uh, according to these verses. Verse 13 says that those that stay on the wide road are many. Verse 22, the same thing. It says, on that day, many will say to me. These false prophets are pretty successful at what they do. <laughs> Hypothetically speaking, of course, right? Completely hypothetical. Um, Jesus is warning us to beware of these people that are trying to mislead us away from the narrow path. Uh, and that's what we're going to be unpacking today. So Jesus says, beware of these false prophets. So first, we've got to know uh, who these folks are. Um, let's start with a prophet. What is a prophet? Just the, Before we know what a false prophet is, we have to know what an actual prophet is. So what, what's a prophet? Might tell us. Say that again. Somebody that can tell the future. Okay. All right. That's one aspect of it. What else? It's a prophet. It's a different kind of prophet. Different kind of prophet. Yeah. So you got a prophet that's a foreteller. That's telling the future. Okay. What's a fourth teller? Ah, proclaims truth. Okay. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. His word is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, good point. And, and really, that's, that's where the concept of a prophet started was with sin. 
you know, ever since the fall of man and man being entirely lost, well, the natural result of that, it man turns their back on God and runs as far away in the other direction as we can go. Well, so in order to draw us back to God, God chose prophets. They were sent by God with God's message um, to call people back to him. It was the, the, the purpose of a prophet. Um, and a, pro- a true prophet, as you were saying, was God's voice. It was chosen by God, sent by God with a message from God. I think the perfect example of a prophet is when God is speaking to Moses and telling him he's going to go before Pharaoh. What was Moses' response? Why, why should he not go before Pharaoh? What did he say? Who remembers? I stutter. I can't speak well. I'm not qualified. I don't know what to say anyway. Like every, every, everything he could think of. But it was primarily around his speech. And so what was God's response back to him when he was like, I don't know what to say? What did God tell him? Yeah, I, they will be my words, right? And that's the definition of the prophet Moses, chosen by God, given God's words to say to an audience of God's choosing. You know, that, that is the prophet. So God's man, God's message, God's audience. Now, what do we know about Satan's ways? Does Satan create anything new, or does he simply twist, distort, counterfeit, change? Counterfeit, right? And what do we know about a half-truth? What is a half-truth? A half-truth is a whole lie, right? Yeah. Yeah, he, 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 he counterfeits, he twists, he changes. Um, so what did Satan do with the concept of a prophet? There's still a prophet, but a false prophet, a twist, a change. You know, it's just, just slightly different. Just, just a little, you know, just a little. Sir? Mm. Ahab and Jehoshaphat, they were together, and he asked uh, his prophets, should we go to war? And they all said, go on, brother. God gave you the, you know. Yeah. And then uh, he says, well, I don't like what they're saying, so they never tell me the truth, but that's the side of God. But I hate what he says, because he always tells me the truth. Yeah, I hate what he says, but it's always the truth. Yeah. 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 And so he does. See, I told you he wouldn't say anything. Yeah. Sometimes. Than even um, yeah. those of us who are supposed to know it firsthand. Yeah. Contrary to his name. <laughs> so, this concept of a false prophet, then, uh, we talked about what a prophet is. What is that? What is a false prophet? Um, you know, we see all over the Bible, we see false prophets. We see them in the Old Testament, see them in the New Testament. Um, so let's look at a couple of them here. If you would, turn, turn with me um, to Jeremiah 14, 14. I want to look at that verse. Jeremiah 14, 14. And whoever gets there and wants to read it, go for it. Fourteen, fourteen. And the Lord said unto me, The prophets prophesy lies in my name. I sent them not, neither have I commanded them, neither have spoken unto them. They prophesy unto you a false vision, a divination, and a thing of nothing in the deceit of their heart. 
What do we what do we see just in that one verse about false prophets? What are some of the characteristics you see there? Deceit. Yes. They are not sanctioned. By sanctioned, what do you mean? Yeah. Not approved, not sent, not chosen by God. Yeah. A lot of them really believe what they're preaching. Okay. Many of them were were you said deceit. A lot of them were deceived themselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. What what'd you say? Worthless. Worthless. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, not sent. Go ahead. Mm. God's and this one, God. Yeah. The prophet's not calling it worthless. And, and so here, this, this is something that I think is, is vitally important. It looks good, it sounds good in the mainstream life, mainstream world. It probably is valued as being good. Sure. But God calls it worthless. And so, you know, I think sometimes. We, we think about false prophets or even demons in this in that sense as just being so obvious you go, hey, ain't no way I'm following that guy. Yeah. That's not true. Mm-hmm. That is not true at all. False false prophets, the deceivers and, and the wolves in sheep's clothing are so subtly <clears throat> hidden mm-hmm. all that, that they're easily followed, even by people who don't want to be deceived. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think a lot of folks have been deceived and bought the lie. Because the scripture says that's the case. And, and and it's not because, you know, they want to go play with snakes. Yeah. It's because there's something that the scripture confronts them in their heart that they would rather keep the worldly view yeah. than the godly view. And once you do that, once you sell out that one issue, whatever it may be, and it may be minor, it may be, you know, take out the trash on Thursday, whatever. Once you sell out and you choose worldliness as opposed to godliness, yeah. then you have walked right past that gate, that narrow gate, and you've listened to the voices, the mainstream voices, the flow going down the broad road, false prophets that are saying yeah. look man look the Bible says every day is the same you know why do you got to take your trash out on Thursday take it out on Friday well the problem is the trash truck comes Friday morning you know so you got to, so you're missing a key a key point scripture gets twisted all the time gets turned all the time gets used against the original intent to deceive you into doing something that you shouldn't do and I think it really begins because God calls it worthless. And Satan says, no, wait. Let's be practical here. Yeah. Is that really worthless? Yeah. It may not be best. I got it. Sure. But you know, all these other people can't be wrong. And there's a lot of people. And all these yeah. other teachers out there who are teaching the same thing. Yeah. These guys went to school. They know what's going on. How is it that that's a little old fashioned? God thinks that that's worthless. Yeah. It doesn't take much. Not at all. Like I said, just it's 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 a twist, it's just a twist. just slightly. We had um, <coughs> the Charismatics came out with the middle of last year. I mean, right after the election, and so many of them prophesied false and the other uh, the presidential election. They had a, a, a big coming together and signed this document. It was something I, I forget the exact wording on it, but it, the the gist of it was. Uh, just because someone prophesies falsely does not make them a false prophet. Mm. And I'm like, that's contrary to scripture. Mm-hmm. And, and, that exactly and, uh, yeah. Yeah. and you have, sadly enough, you have uh, in modern SBC life, you have a lot of people standing in the pulpit saying, God told me this, God told me that. Just preach the word of God because yeah. what you're saying agrees with scripture. Scripture says that. And if what you say disagrees with scripture, then it's false. And I think that they don't have enough faith in power to say it comes from this, yeah. that they're wanting to add to it. They're trying to embellish. They're trying to, I don't know, put makeup on it and make it palatable to this world here. Yeah, and, and it already says in here that this is not palatable to the world. Right. It's not changing the heart. Yeah, actually, great. the qualification.
justification for a false prophet is not that you prophesy something that doesn't come true. God said they can either prophesy things that are going to come true, but if that prophecy doesn't come from me, that's yeah. Yeah, it even, even says in, uh, in Deuteronomy 13 that even if they prophesy a future event, so foretelling, I think you called it, foretelling, and that event comes true, but if the rest of their messages are taking you away from me and towards a fake God, what you should do is kill that person. Stone them to death. Even if they are telling the future, he says, if they're taking you away from me, stone them. That is helpful. Mm. But in a sense, it's almost solid. You can't see through it. The only way that we can see through that is studying the Word of God, hide it in our heart, and the leadership and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> when you bring it down to my nephew, who is an Armenian pastor, the boy loves God. Now, is he a false prophet? Well, no. He, he preaches a lot of truth. He loves God. I believe he's probably saved. <clears throat> but the, it gets, you know, it gets foggy right there for me. Sure. It's not foggy for God. He knows if he's a right. or not. Yeah. But it's, I have to be real careful on my judgment of people. <clears throat> you know, when it comes to that point, the false prophet is somebody who is a wolf in sheep's clothing. He looks good, but you can tell a tree by the fruit. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying, if everything he says but this one thing is a lie, yeah. then yeah. he might have just lucked out on that one or yeah. something. You know, might have sure. just hit it just right. <clears throat> so you look at the tree, you look at the lifestyle, and you have to see bad fruit continuously. Yeah. And, and it just it gets foggy for me when you get down sure. to the, the nitty gritty. And the only way that, that I'm free to say that's a false prophet is I can I peeked under the sheepskin and I see yeah. the wolf. And I know him to be a wolf by his fruit. Sure. Yeah, and that's the kind of what we were talking about a couple weeks ago with what religion does. Hmm. Where religion just looks at outward appearances. So in this case, you know, if we were going to deal with your nephew from a religious perspective, well, he's an Armenian. We're Reformed. He's yeah. obviously lost and wrong because he's not following the, the theological system that we know is the truth. But faith doesn't answer questions that way. Faith understands that, especially from a sovereign grace perspective, yeah. that salvation is by sovereign grace. And so, I was reading, I think it was Richard Baxter this week, he was talking about don't criticize people for the way they worship, uh, just because they don't worship exactly like you. And I think Baxter has a point there, that we look beyond the surface appearances. And, and we, that's the beautiful thing about Christ. You know, we know Christ brings all people together. We think about that as being red and yellow, black and white. They are precious in his sight. You know, the Jesus loves the children of the world kind of deal. But Jesus loved Arminians and Pelagians yeah. and Reformed and Neo-Reformed and even some Universalists and some stuff like that because we can look beyond those those external, those, those surface appearances, those labels, those denominations. And we can look at somebody like your nephew who, if he's preaching the word and he's leading people to Christ, then he's not scattering. Yeah. He's gathering. Right? Yeah. And that's what Jesus said. Look, either you're scattering or you're gathering. And those people who are gathering, they're with us. They're with me. And so... We can look beyond all those labels. And I hope but a lot a lot of religion won't do that. Yeah. And, and we just have to be mindful of that as well. Yeah. Because it is easy. And the reason why I'm saying this, I'm I'm sorry, please forgive me, but um, it's because 
it is so hard to discern truth from error, mm. to discern those false prophets. I mean, it's hard. Yeah. You have to have your senses quickened. You have to be in the Word. Yeah. You have to be studied. You have to be prayed up. You have to be in the fellowship of God's people and having the Word administered <clears throat> on an ongoing basis. So those are just necessary prerequisites. Yeah. I'm not going to learn to bench press uh, 300 pounds if I never pick up a dumbbell. Right? I just, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And so we have to have those things, but we have to look beyond what our physical eyes see and what our physical mind tells us and see what Christ is doing mm -hmm. and look with spiritual eyes and have a spiritual understanding. Well, and, and that's where it, it, you know, as we said, obviously, Jesus laid out the order of this sermon in the perfect order, <laughs> you know, but it goes back to that ask and it will be given. That, that whole concept was really about spiritual discernment under all of these things. And so you're to point, yeah, it, it is something that is, can be asked for and given. Uh, and we'll go, you know, Lord willing, later today, next week, coming weeks, however long it takes us to go through this. Um, the Lord is talking about a specific um, false prophet, a specific type of person, per se. And we'll, we'll hopefully get more into that, um, you know, in the coming weeks. Um, sir. A good one. That's one of the things that uh, we should consider as we're reading that, it applies to here. Mm -hmm. The devil got on the right road when he, when he decided, or when he figured out, God's spirit let him know you're in the city of destruction, you need to flee yeah. to the celestial city. You didn't just go from point A to point B. We, and, and we don't get a real time frame for some of the stories and the ways that he went off. Sure. Bad. But he will set people time after Help him and direct him and redirect him back to yeah. that, that path that he knew he was supposed to be on. Absolutely. And, and I, I, as far as some, a couple of them said there that you know we need to not be too hasty. Mm -hmm. Just name them. They're false prophets. Yeah. Man, we were all false prophets. Yeah. Every one of us in this room was a false prophet because we spoke nothing but falseness unless yeah. it, it agreed with us in the Bible and it helped us look better. Yeah. That would be the only exception. And these people that are even preaching from pulpits have false doctrine. Well, God's not through with them yet. So yeah. We're going to have people show up at the gate with us. We're going to look at them and say, Who said you could come out here? Yeah. I saw you. <laughs> well, no. The, the thing to remember, particularly from these Old Testament passages, is that we clearly also see a picture of, you know, the, the saying it takes two to tango. You know, you see these, these uh, false prophets there, whether it's in Deuteronomy 13, Jeremiah 14. Um, ultimately, if they're not sent by God and or they are not giving God's message, they are a false prophet. But we also see in Isaiah 30 where it says that the, there are people that are unwilling to hear from the Lord. And this is what they say to their prophets. Don't say what is right. Speak smooth things. Prophesy illusions. Turn aside from God's path. And so ultimately, there's not only people who want to tell us these lies, be false prophets, but there's also people who want to hear those lies. And just as you say in, in, in business, you, you can have the greatest you know, product in the world, but if you don't have a customer, it doesn't matter. Well, in this case, there's a customer as well as somebody selling that product. Jeremiah 531 says, the prophets prophesy falsely and my people love to have it so. And that's that. It's, it's the whole itching ears concept of that also. Um, now, getting back to Jesus here in Matthew uh, 7, what he says, he tells us to beware of false prophets. And ultimately, this, this phrase uh, used here to beware, it literally in the Greek means to hold back your mind from, protect your mind from, stay away from, don't interact with, don't absorb, don't take in, don't pay attention to is the idea. Um, and, the, and the reason that we shouldn't do that is because false prophets are dangerous. We've already said it a, a lot, but what in the, 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 the last couple of words of verse 15, what is it about the false prophets that is dangerous? What does Jesus say about them in verse 15? They are what? Ravenous wolves. 
So <clears throat> this same uh, analogy of false prophets being ravenous wolves is used in Ezekiel uh, 22, where it says that they are like wolves tearing their prey apart. Okay, and so this is an Old Testament and a New Testament concept here. Um, why, is a, why is a wolf dangerous to a sheep in the first place? They are worse than dogs. By worse than dogs, what do you mean? How's a wolf worse than a dog to a sheep? They'll eat the sheep. And talking about the worse than dogs, the wolf is better equipped to eat the sheep. <laughs> Wolves are faster than dogs, bigger than dogs, bigger teeth than dogs, more aggressive than dogs, you know, all of those things. Um, smarter than dogs. The, the, their pack mentality is stronger. Their hunting I mean, all of those things. They have a real kill instinct. Kill instinct, absolutely. The, the, the sheep by itself is totally defenseless against the wolf, and ultimately the wolf is driven to eat the sheep. Um, this adjective, this ravenous, um, it, it means to steal. It means vicious. It means violently greedy. It's almost like I can see the, it, it's the image of the wolf at the moment that he is sinking his teeth into the sheep and dragging it away in the dark. It is a, a stealing concept. Um, and, um, whereas in 1 Corinthians 5, this same Greek word is translated as a swindler. Somebody that, that defrauds other people by using their words and, and takes from them by, by um, wrongful means. And that's what the wolf is. The wolf is taking a meal by wrongful means. He is taking something that belongs to someone else. Yeah. P Peter calls them natural brute beasts. Um, essentially, the image being painted here, this is not necessarily a misguided person. This is a well this, or excuse me, it is not a misguided person, not a well-intentioned person. This is someone that is out and out intentionally seeking to deceive, attack, and destroy. And so, yes, you see an image of a false prophet in the Old Testament that is self-deceived in the sense from their own blinded by their sin, but not self-deceived in the sense that they are just innocent of it. The picture being painted here is not an innocent, somebody that accidentally stumbled and ate a sheep. Oh, I didn't know I was eating a sheep. It was a mistake. No, this is an intentional attack being painted here. It's the same error. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, and what I'm what I'm not saying is that somebody simply mistaken is not wrong. I'm not saying they shouldn't be corrected. I'm not saying they're not a false prophet. What I'm saying is that this particular that Jesus is addressing here is a particular point of a false that is purposefully out to deceive, attack, lead astray, kill the flock, you know. In this case, yes. Yeah. And, and um, well, let, let's just ask that in and of ourselves. Um, when we sin and we deceive somebody, why are we doing that? Why do we deceive? So, why are they deceiving the king, the person, the whoever, the false prophet, for their own benefit, you know? Yeah, define benefit, but it's something that is to their own. It's not of a selfless means. I'm not lying to you selflessly. 
you know, the false prophet is lying for selfish means. The wolf in this case, what does the wolf get? A meal. You know, lunch. Yeah. That's interesting. And there's a protective mechanism for sure. Um, I think he, the, the rest of the, the lesson right here is really summing it up. <clears throat> for me to go to another Baptist church and hear uh, do good Armenian ser- uh, sermon. Yeah. And this is where I'm coming from. I sat there and just turned him off. And I think that's probably wrong. I've been convicted over it, you know, because there might be some good in there somewhere. Yeah. And the thing is, it, it, it goes on and talking about bearing fruit, tell them about a tree. So you've got to, it's not just walk out there and look at it. You've got to kind of study it. you got to got to know every year it bears that same fruit. Uh, I see the apples. I know it's an apple tree. Uh, was it grafted in? Or, you know, sure, you sure. Gotta know. You got to look under the sheet clothes to see what it is. And the only way you can do that is to, to watch and to learn. Yeah. I was convicted over going in and just turning people off. Because mm. later on, I happened to hear something and it was pretty good. You know, and it was true. <clears throat> the leadership of the Holy Spirit and my own conscience. There's so much in our belief about conscience for, for sure. conscience sake. God is, is ruling over my conscience. Yeah. And he has, he has put his spirit in me as a Christian. And he's, the Holy Spirit is leading me into all truth and, and giving me understanding as I study the word. So the only thing I can rely on is what I've learned through the Bible. And I haven't learned it all. None of us have. So we got to be really careful over yeah. condemning Baptist preachers yeah. or Presbyterian preachers, sure. whatever you're going to listen to. <clears throat> now, I'm not talking about somebody way off, you know, a Joe Olsen. I'm not, sure. We all know that what that is. <clears throat> but to, to go into a, a brother's Baptist church and listen to a good man that loves God and serving him, yep. we don't well, and and keep in mind once again, Jesus laid out the perfect order, yeah. and this entire chapter, the big context of it is judgment, and it started off with judge not, and of course we went through all of that and looking at the intentions of others, and and so this comes after that in that context, and we talked about at that time that the Christian life is a balance. It is a very thin walk. So many things that Jesus says here in the sermon is, is, is describing some of these nuances and these understanding of a kingdom life. And it, it, it applies here as well. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop here. But uh, next week, we'll start off by getting into uh, this wolf. You know, Jesus here doesn't warn us about the wolf because it's a wolf. Sheep know to be scared of a wolf. They see a wolf. They know what a wolf looks like. The reason they're being warned about the wolf is because what the wolf is wearing. And that's what we're going to get into next week a little bit, those, those clothes that this wolf is wearing and the, the, the real danger that's in that. So we'll uh, take a break and get back together in a few.